It's actually broadcasting from the other room. Yeah. Well, you know all about that. I think I know. Anyway, uh, we have a little piece of business to do first, and that is to have an annual meeting. We just kind of have to do it. So uh, I would like to uh, start off by suggesting that we reorganize for a little over a year. And a board of elected, a board of directors was elected a year ago, and that consisted of Tupper Colombo, Corinne Cooper, Danny Cohn, Paul Carnahan, Jackie Dennison, Mike Doyle, Eric Gilbertson, Steve Rivellini, Kathleen Boyer was elected treasurer, Beverly Hill secretary, Jennifer Boyer vice chair, and penalty for me stirring the pot was they elected the chairman. So that is the board that this uh, organization is being run on right now. Over the last year, we had several activities. We started with our first annual show until last year about this time. Uh, we did a common cracker exhibit at the Vermont History Museum at the Pavilion, an uh, opening reception for that affair. And we had a program in the fall of history of, of State House News. Uh, we developed the Lane exhibit, and we're going to hear a little bit more about Lane today at the Walgreens window. I think many of you saw that. Uh, our second annual show and tell today, we're going to put a new exhibit in the Walgreens window within a week or two. That's been a very good thing for us. Uh, Middlesex Grange Curtain uh, has a bunch of 17 different ads for Montpelier businesses. And Paul Heller has drawn up the history of each of those, a very short history of each of those. We plan to exhibit that, uh, that stage curtain. And this fall, we are planning a Greenmount Cemetery uh, walking tour. So that is some of the activities that we've been engaged in. We're a full bunch. We inherited some money uh, from the past historical society we have managed to earn as much as we've spent so we still have about the same amount that we started with but dues are a very important part of our income you each found a little piece of paper on your chair we encourage you to to join our organization uh, we don't have a lot of sources of income another source of income is sponsorship of our events and the Lane exhibit, for instance, was sponsored by Heaney Realtors and Cody Chevrolet. We'll be looking for additional sponsors for additional exhibits. The, uh, we're also very fortunate to have space at the bridge office. Uh, we could use more space. We have a collection to, to catalog, and we need space to do that. So anybody that knows of any free heated space, we'd be uh, happy to listen. The last piece of business we have to do today is to reelect or to elect four directors whose terms are expiring. And those four people would be Tupper Colombo, Danny Cohn, Corinne Cooper, and myself. So if I didn't hear any other nominations from the floor, I would invite somebody to make the motion that those four be reelected as named. Me. Yes, it's been made and it's been seconded. Danny. Sure. <laughs> and uh, so hearing, uh, hearing no discussion on that point, I would invite a vote. All those in favor of electing those four people say aye. 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 Contrary minded? Okay, it's done. And, uh, and, and just uh, my notes say one more thing, and that is join. Uh, join our organization. You can do it here or you can do it online. So, moving right along, that is the, I would invite a motion to, uh, to uh, adjourn the annual meeting. It's been made and seconded again by Jennifer and made by Mike. And so the meeting is over, and we can start with why we came here, which is the show and tell, our second annual show and tell. We're going to start with the Wayside Restaurant, Brian and Karen and Nick Zeccanelli. 
who are here tonight. Hey. And uh, <laughs> we'd like to tell you a little bit about the Wayside. And apparently, you're going to kind of have to have to go with the program here. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces here today. Thanks for the invitation. Got a short presentation. Uh, we'd like to open things up for questions and answers, and Karen can chime in on the question and answer period, but I'd like to run through a few things for you here. Uh, Karen's folks, who you know, ran the wayside for 30 plus years. We've run the wayside for over 25 years. That's a total of well over 50 years in the Galfetti and Zeccanelli families. Since it's show and tell, and I think the last time I did show and tell, I was at Air Street School uh, over in Barrie, third or fourth grade, and uh, so I brought some things along to pass around. So if you could circulate this picture of the wayside, it's uh, in the form of a puzzle. We sell the puzzles at the wayside. A um, customer put the puzzle together, framed it, and gave it back to us. So it's a <laughs> prized possession. It looks so cool, and it's retro with the old cars. And, uh, any car buffs would recognize all those different models, so enjoy looking at that. Today, the wayside is 105 years old. <coughs> There were two families that owned the Wayside prior to the Galfetti and Seconelli families. An amazing lady by the name of Effie Ballou opened the Wayside in 1918. We call her our founding mother. There's a picture of her in 1908, and she opened the Wayside 10 years after that beautiful photo was taken. The United States of America has a founding father, George Washington. The Wayside has a founding mother, Effie Ballou. Effie was a pioneer in the hospitality industry. Imagine her as a woman business owner, and she couldn't even vote in 1918. It wasn't until two years after opening the Wayside that she was allowed to vote in 1920. Effie also had a very challenging start to her new business. Only two months after opening the Wayside in July of 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic killed over 50 million people worldwide. The city of Barrie was hit particularly hard since a lot of the granite workers had granite dust in their lungs. Her small roadside lunch stand not only survived, but expanded and prospered during the Roaring Twenties. The Wayside has also prevailed through the Great Depression and World War II, many more wars, and financial crises. The Wayside's biggest challenge to date was navigating the extremely stormy waters of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Wayside's second pandemic. Thanks to our first-hand knowledge of the Spanish flu in 1918, combined with a very dedicated staff of over 60 employees, the Wayside now is stronger than ever. And I'd like Nicholas to stand up and show off his t-shirt. Your turn. <laughs> show and tell. And turn around and open up your shirt. These are shirts we had printed up um, as we were emerging from the pandemic. Hey! It was, uh, they served as a source of pride and inspiration for our staff that we were wayside 102 years strong and nothing was going to stop us from getting back on our feet that's right thank you nicholas in 2004 the wayside hosted the biggest world series party in the area for the boston red sox it had been 84 years since the red sox last won the world series again in 1918 when we opened. 
Yes. That was quite a year. Shortly after we took over the wayside from Karen's parents, I decided to make a bold proclamation. If the Red Sox ever win the World Series, we will roll our prices back to 1918. Hey! It seemed like a very safe bet to me. And we got tons of publicity for years. However, in 2004, it was time for Brian in the wayside to pay up. So we'll circulate this menu that we had for the day. Cup of coffee was five cents, donut five cents, soup ten cents, grilled hot dog ten cents, vanilla ice cream ten cents, and a small amount fountain beverage five cents. Who's the gentleman that uh, has run WDEV or something? Ken Squire. Ken Squire. And has a, uh, a reputation for being kind of frugal. <laughs> and, um, so he was sitting at the counter. The place was packed. Let, let me finish uh, this thing and then I'll share that story with you. Instead of the normal 1,000 customers a day, we had over 3,000 hungry Red Sox fans converge on the wayside for the celebration of a lifetime. Oh. <laughs> it was wall to wall people. The minute we opened the door, it was like the floodgates came in and people were bringing in rubbings of their deceased father from the cemetery that never enjoyed this experience or a victory like that. It was emotional. Uh, but Ken Squire was sitting at the counter with a bunch of people and uh, someone yelled over to him, you know, Ken, at five cents a cup, can you buy the counter a round of coffees? <laughs> it's like 13 seats, pounds of nail. He said no. <laughs> it was a great day. The, the only real addition we've made in the past 25 years was adding our very own creamery. So now it's Wayside Restaurant, Bakery, and Creamery. We struggled with the fact that we served homemade soups, homemade meals, and homemade baked goods served with store-bought ice cream. We understood that Ben and Jerry's was in the neighboring town of Waterbury and didn't want to compete with them. Our staff wanted us to develop the best old-fashioned ice cream possible. The consistency would be creamy and smooth, no chunks. No chunky monkey style ice creams. Prior to launching all of our ice creams, we just had to do a taste test with our staff. In a blind taste test, 80% of our staff chose our signature vanilla ice cream over Ben and Jerry's vanilla. Mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For those of you that like happy hours, did you know that we are the only restaurant in America that starts its day with a happy hour and ends its day with a happy hour? So, the first happy hour begins at 7 and goes till 8 a.m. And that's where you get free old-fashioned buttermilk donut holes okay. with your coffee or your breakfast. So that's a happy hour for me. I love those donut rolls. Our happy hour at the end of the day is from 7.30 to 8.30. It's the after dinner happy hour and all desserts are half price. So finally, before we open it up for questions, we have uh, want to give you uh, our new brochure which is connected to our new website and a postcard for everybody to take home. Nice. 
and I'll explain uh, the brochure and the postcard. Uh, let me hang on to one of those postcards. When we designed this postcard, we wanted to put ourselves in a tourist's shoes, and they're always asking, whether it's at the gas station or anybody they come in contact with, where do the locals eat? So we figured we'd make that the headline on the postcard, on the uh, card. And whether the person stuffing the uh, rack puts it in front or back, it says where the locals eat on both sides. One side fo focuses on being Montpelier's first green restaurant. And while the previous brochure had our solar panels on the roof for our hot water heating, uh, this is our most recent green initiative, a community solar installation located in Perkinsville, Vermont. So we're continually trying to keep up with being a green restaurant, minimizing our carbon footprint. On the back side, Yankee cooking at its best. We just got the driveway paved and restriped. And it's looking pretty good. And to keep up with the times, so we've got the QR code. So you can take your phone, scan that, and it'll bring you to our new website. And the new website, to me, feels like you're, it's a history lesson with a nice warm blanket over your shoulders. It's really designed nicely and there's a history page, a Green Initiatives page, there's uh, videos, I think there's eight or ten videos and we suggest that people uh, make batch popcorn and uh, enjoy the videos. So that's it um, in terms of our, oh the postcard, uh, this one we always wanted a greetings from the wayside postcard, and we met this guy in Waterbury, Ken Gardner, who brought it to life. And every one of these 18 images is individually displayed in the restaurant. So if you walk around the restaurant, it's like an art gallery. Not many people know this, but it took 18 images to create this one little postcard. And we will be coming out with this in a puzzle format probably this fall. At the Capitol building, and a kid on a rope, uh, but it's a, a beautiful piece of art, and uh, we want you each to have a postcard, mail it to someone that might remember the wayside and appreciate, you know, that we're still going strong and having a good time. Any questions for Karen and I? Uh, yeah. What's that picture? This one is in our. This one isn't with us. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, there was. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, but regarding that picture, I don't know if folks know that our house up on the hill um, was the Wayside Lodge before there was a Wayside lunch stand. And we actually have a horsehair plaster um, sign uh, that we uh, still have. It was a the house is older, and, and inside the house, the PQs can attest that it's a beautiful old home, and the, the banister going upstairs is tiger maple. You can see the uh, stripes in it. It's just a gorgeous home. saying that, uh, I'll second the motion, and we are blessed, and that's certainly how we recovered from the pandemic. We had such a dedicated staff, and the folks out front know what customer service is all about, and it can be contagious. Um, so many of them have been with the wayside a long time, and if we have, say, 60-plus employees, I think we did the math for our most recent Legacy Awards ceremony 
Karen got her 45 year black. Uh, but combined, I think 35 employees have over 500 years of experience. So they've been there a long time and if we're not there on a busy Sunday afternoon, the, the place uh, is going to still purr like a kitten. And it's also generational, like the like Floyd Bird's mother worked here, then she had her son Jeff in there, and then Jeff had his two sons working there. So there's a lot of generational uh, possibilities too. It's nice. <coughs> what was named the Wayside? It was the Wayside uh, Lunch initially. Somehow the Wayside Lunch sign ended up in Washington and we'd like to get it back someday. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, it evolved into um, kind of like a diner and then a restaurant. And since we do have the counter, it'll always be designated as kind of a diner, but I hope that we've worked hard to evolve into a, a menu that's uh, pretty special with salmon and seafood and steaks and tripe. good stuff. Tripe? Pickled, yeah! Pickled honeycomb fried tripe. And uh, on the menu front, uh, during the COVID uh, close down, we did uh, work hard and uh, I think now our turkey dinner is better than ever. So we, we continue to listen to customers and try to make improvements every year. Before we get much more hungry, maybe we should uh, yeah, I I know. move along to it. We thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next we're going to hear from Ware and Sons, Barbara and Lanier. And today we have Paul Blair and John Boucher with us. So uh, here you go. Do this. I, I, I went through, through our attic and tried to grab a few things I thought would be 
interested. Um, I, I have just a, 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 a registered book of uh, from Margaret Lane back in the 1930s, and some of the prices that, that were uh, things cost back then. It's pretty remarkable. I thought that was just kind of an interesting. And I'm going to hand the mic to uh, Paul. He's going to talk about the buildings and from the history of Gordon Sons and so forth. So what I want to start with is with, with my grandparents, uh, which, which is Thomas Jefferson Ware, who was named after Thomas <laughs> Jefferson. That's what they used to do back then. Is, uh, that generation named their children after presidents. In the, uh, so Thomas Jefferson Ware married my grandmother, who was Florence Emmons, in, in, up on Main Street, uh, going up Main Street about halfway up. You know, there's an Emmons Street that goes off to the right, and that's named after my great grandparents. That house on the corner that has just been recently renovated uh, was built by my great, right, Catherine? Great, great, great grandparents. I think it was. Um, so we have a street in town named after our family. But anyway, my grandmother and my grandfather worked for the Ballum Furniture and Funeral. Uh, company in Montpelier right after the turn of the century and they closed uh, they didn't they didn't sell they just closed so then my they went to the embalming school down in Boston and my grandmother was asked to go because there was another woman that that was going to go to that class she said that she would go if another woman attended it and that's what, why my grandmother went to embalming schools to, uh, to be with this other woman that, that, uh, in that school in Boston. So, so she was a licensed embalmer. I don't think she did a whole lot with it, but just because of that invitation to uh, attend the school. But that was in 1918, during, uh, they mentioned it earlier about the, uh, the Spanish flu in 1918, which was going strong at that point. And they actually, uh, on a three or four months course, they actually only attended the course for six weeks. And they were called home because of the because of all the deaths that were taking place in you know, in Barry Montpelier area. So they only they were only there for a very short while. But they I, I say they worked for Ballums, and then my grandfather in 1921 uh, purchased the Frank Hall funeral home that was on East State Street, um, and started and started his own business in 1921. And we have a picture here of my grandfather sitting in his office. Um, which which his first office is was I should say is where the mud block in was down here um, right at the end of Barry Street. It's an empty empty lot now. I think it's help me with what's there now. Um, uh, right, right, right across the street. Um, it's just a park. It's an empty it's an empty oh, lot. Tomasi block. Tomasi block. That's it. It was the Tomasi block that my grandfather had uh, an office on one side. He had a few caskets over the wall. Tomasi's block, but also it's where Paul Redmond's bakery was. Right. That's where, that was his first office. <coughs> and then in 1926, 27, they needed more room and they actually bought a funeral home directly across the street here where my Aunt Claire and my cousin Catherine <laughs> lived. <laughs> directly across the street and they stayed there until 1954 54 55 when they when my father needed more room and moved it over on the school street in that building um, just for historical purposes that was built in 18 I believe in 1892 by the Putnam family from Putnamville it was built for their um, I can't think of the, the husband's name but the, the, the daughter she, she was a Putnam but it was that for a wedding present um, that was built, and then the people owned that until I think he died in like 1923, and then another sister moved into it, and then George McIntyre, Dr. McIntyre, probably people know, Dr. McIntyre owned that, and my father bought it from him in 1955, uh, and we've been there ever since. Um, so it, it's the business is 100 and I don't know, 18, 105. Yeah, uh, Barbara Lanier started. In 1918, and my grandfather went on his own in 1921. So it's, it's been in the same family, you know, that length, that length of time. In the uh, so 
I want to end with a quick story. Quick story. 1984. I I, I was I went up to Mrs. Leahy's house. Mr. Leahy had just passed that morning, and I went up to see Mrs. Leahy to make arrangements. And I say I was I was new kind of new to this business, and the I'm kind of nervous when I go in to see Mrs. Leahy. And so I was met at the front door, and uh, by this nice lady and son. She says you'll have to come in and sit in the parlor. And, uh, okay. <laughs> So I went in and sat down, and she goes, Mrs. Leahy is talking to President Reagan on the phone, and you'll have to wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a true story. But. So I think that's, so we got some other pictures. I, did want, I do want to mention, though, my Uncle Paul, uh, who was actually in the business with my father uh, right after World War II, and my other uncle, Tom, and then, uh, my father was the only one that stayed with the business. Um, Uncle Paul moved on to being uh, more of a, a writer, other things. <laughs> yeah. In the, um, judge. <laughs> the judge. Yeah, he was a judge. Yeah. So that just, any, I wanted to open it up for any questions. I saw you had some memorabilia from the Brist Bristol Manufacturing. The, these are the, those are the, um, the garments. Oh, these garments, uh, these are old. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing these go back into the um, CCC times when my grandfather had that contract. Uh, there used to be, when they built the dam in the, in the state parks, there was, you know, two or 3,000 people, you know, in, in, on those work sites. In the, um, obviously, they, they needed that service from time to time. And my grandfather had that service, but these garments would, uh, it would be used to uh, ship bodies back, you know, they put out of their, uh, on the train and ship bodies home. Bristol was Vermont manufacturer. The primary product was casket. Yes. In fact, there's still a casket that is, that's made and sold in this area. They call it the Bristol. It's made by Florence Casket Company out of uh, Florence Max. They named it the Bristol because it's a copy of the up there casket. Yeah. Yeah. Which house on East State Street? was a funeral home at one time. Is it still there? You know, I don't know which one it was. It was behind um, your father's place, up the street. And, I, and again, I'm not sure exactly which one it was. Um, I don't think it was part of the fire. I think it was beyond, it was beyond that. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure. But, yeah. Can I add something just to, I'll forget it when I get to mine, so yeah. I'll say it now. Your grandfather and my grandfather owned the land that these two, that the convent and the, these two buildings here are on now. And it was, it was, I don't know whether it was sold or donated or whatever it was, but at one point it was, uh, they owned it and then they built the convent and the schools on that land. And the land, the building that used to be on the corner here was my grandfather's and that got moved across the street where the sign shop is now. All right. That used to be part of his land. Mm. And can I add one little thing to get your brother in trouble while I'm at it? <laughs> when, I, when I was in high school, I was good friends with his uh, older brother. And he used to answer the phone at the house saying, Where's you stab him, we slap him. <laughs> I, I, I used to sit there and cringe and think, God, I hope his father isn't home now. He's <laughs> 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 dead. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. I just wanted to take this opportunity to share my appreciation for the both of you and for the work that your families have done. I know a lot of people in this room probably have experienced some really hard times with these two guys standing in the back. And I just think um, it's wonderful that you do this work. It's very heavy. And we appreciate yeah, that you do that for our community. Thank you. Yeah. told his story, I'd tell mine, and we try to keep this completely nonpartisan. But the, the Guerres have have always been the, the gracious ones who who um, helped us at, at times of, of sadness. And so he told you about when my father died, 
in about 1984 and that my mother was talking to Ronald Reagan. So I told him about when my mother died in um, 1996 in May. <clears throat> we were, my, my brothers and I were at St. Augustine's um, trying to make arrangements for the funeral and we were picking out music um, and someone came in with a phone and said to my brother, um, the president is on the phone. This is 1996, May. And um, Pat handed the phone to me and he said um, he, he'd like to, that the president would like to express his condolences. I mean, we don't know these people, you know, believe me, but this is the kind of courtesy that goes on in Washington. So, um, in those days anyway. And um, so I, I'm like, uh, you know, and I hear this very, very southern accent saying, I'd like to express my condolences for the loss of your mother. And I realized, of course, it was President Clinton. And I said, oh, Mr. President, you know, if she had known she was going to check out this early, the election was in November, she would have requested an absentee ballot. <laughs> <laughs> A complete silence, an exclamation mark at the other end of the phone. Well, I, I thank you very much. <laughs> So, on our end of it, we were we were pretty convinced that President Clinton was going to call the funeral that day. Oh. We we were we were pretty certain that was happening. Oh. So when the phone rang, we were all running for it. <laughs> 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 so it's funny that you brought that up. Okay, so this is living history. <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't have I. I really hoped I wouldn't be next to a display like this because I have very little. Um, but one thing, I'll pass around one of my all-time favorite, I mean really it's it's my favorite possession. They're the wooden type that I think my father purchased um, a few letters from uh, so his shop began around 1936. So I think he went to the Montpelier Evening Argus, or it might have been called something else at that time, but um, pulled out a few of the letters from a, a, a font that they weren't using anymore. And I'm quite certain it was from the what they had used as, as a major headline when the, when the Civil War started. So these three letters, I, C, E, um, was my father's bread and butter item when he started um, the, the shop on State Street. And these letters spelled ice. He would print them on a little placard that people would put in their windows when the courts drawn ice wagon would come clomping down the street and if if this household wanted ice um, the horse and driver would stop the driver would chunk out some ice and, and it would go into the house's um, uh, uh, what do you, ice chest and um, so anyway I just I just love that um, I have just a few items, and I, I really want to thank the Montpelier Historical Society for giving me this opportunity to, to get the lead out and, and kind of clear the, the cobwebs from my memory. And, and thank you especially to, to George um, for encouraging me to do it. Um, I'm just if you'll bear with me, because my eyes don't permit a lot. Um, just a 
keep from rambling, I, I put down some thoughts. So my memories revolve around the sights and sounds and smells of the letterpress just a kitchen door away from my growing up years at 136 State Street in Montpelier, that the building, part of the building, is now where the Vermont Arts Council is, is headquartered. Prominent in these memories has always been my father, Howard Blady, who founded the press in the Great Depression and grew it into the successful business it became. At the time he sold the Leahy Press in the mid-1970s, it was one of the last two letterpress businesses remaining in the state, apart from a very few, very small specialty presses scattered here and there around New England. The other job letterpress was Edson's on Langdon Street which continued for several more years after my father sold his business and retired. It was there in the Edson Press that a very young Howard lady worked as a printer's devil and learned the trade. When George Edson, and I don't think that's any relation to the printing Edsons, is it? You're correct. Um, when George invited me to be part of today's program, I was delighted to participate. But then, as I searched through the scant bits of information related to the Leahy Press that I actually possessed, I was aghast at the extreme sparsity of the material collection as well as red-faced over my own lack of technical information specific to the operation. I brought printing books along, um, really old, old 1930s editions with um, little images of the presses that my father had. But even though I worked out in the shop with my father proofreading the whole time, did I know how those presses work? I did not. Um, so artifacts from the press are minimal, um, but the ones I have are precious to me, and I brought them to show you today. They tell a story about this small, vibrant press in a way that substantiates my memory and furthers my appreciation for my father. In fact, as I collected these few things together and took a closer look at my mother's hodgepodge of a scrapbook, the story emerging for me becomes one of, of my father himself. It's no, no accident that so little in the way of relics and testaments to the history and success of this business survive such spareness defines this modest man completely. Even though he had a lifelong love of history, my father never, never saw himself as worthy of being singled out as a feature in local history. He never took himself that seriously. He took work seriously. He took his family seriously. He took his community seriously, but himself? I can see his quiet smile kind of widening on his face at the absolute absurdity of the notion. Still, I believe he does factor into the story of Montpelier, the country's smallest capital. The Depression era business he created with his wife, my mother, um, the rich webwork of connections the two of them forged as the business expanded contributed greatly to the city's positive temperament during his lifetime and beyond. 
So with apologies now for my lack of technical skills, uh, to produce something more professional, more alluring and visual for presentation than this table, I have instead assembled a slender, old-fashioned scrapbook holding the very, very few photos I have relative to the Leahy Press. And for the scrapbook's organizing center, I'm using a quote from Mark Twain, which I found several years ago in a biography of this man, who is arguably America's greatest writer. Mark Twain, like Howard Leahy, worked as a printer's devil during his young years. He learned the printing trade and subsequently worked in the publishing house that printed the many volumes of Ulysses Grant's autobiography at, at Mark Twain's urging these were printed. These books without which much of the detail of the Civil War would have been lost to history. Mark Twain was forced to quit school at the age of 12 due to the early death of his father. Howard Leahy was forced to quit school at age 10. And respecting his father's deathbed request that he never, no matter what, work in the granite industry, he did whatever else he could do in order to work full time for the support of his mother and sister, whose lives were upended due to the debilitating sickness and, and death from silicosis of their husband and father at age 32. So when I met, read Mark Twain's words, the printing press is a poor man's university. It was a eureka moment for me. It was the clearest explanation of how it was that my father was so little formal schooling, was the educated person with wide knowledge and understanding of the world, which I knew him to be. So thank you, Mark Twain. I've used that quotation to headline the learning curriculum I described in the scrapbook I brought today. Pursuing such a broad curriculum of lifelong learning and skill building was the daily reality of the Leahy Press for its, its founder, and somewhat similarly for his family. Our lives were shaped by the constant activity of those pounding presses, as well as by the constant stream of community members stopping into the shop to talk with my father. It all unfolded just a single door away from our kitchen. I remember well when a printer, a contemporary of my father's, told me, Howard Lady is the fastest typesetter in Vermont, pronounced Vermont. And, well, he, he was that, but he was also so much more. So, I, I can uh, pass some things around. I, I found this, um, <coughs> I don't think you can really see it, but it's a cut that he used. My father printed um, the, uh, the yearbook and, and the literary magazines for both Montpelier High School and St. Michael's High School. And I was telling someone earlier that the, the contract for um, or the, or the job that had always gone to him to print Montpelier High School was um, ended when the editor of that year's yearbook, who was dating my brother, <laughs> my brother started dating someone else, and my father lost the. That's what happens in a small house. But anyway, in this in this little cut. Um, 
question. I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to be able to see it. I really can't. But anyway, it's the junior class of St. Michael's High School. And we, we all graduated from this building. So we're standing, uh, this is 1962, we're standing on the, by the front door, and it was the officers of that, that year's class. Um, so it, it's kind of, you know, I brought it because this is, this is the building here. <laughs> Well, 136 State Street, um, right down uh, next to the visitor center, the State Visitor Center now, but that, that had been a private home. And um, so in, in that building, it, it's in some of the photos, but my father's shop was literally out the kitchen door. Um, so it was in the back, and at some point in the in the early 1950s, my father expanded it. Um, so it took up. It, it's all been torn down now. We were we were so proud of the of the addition. first business card was made by Howard Leahy, and I remember it as if it was yesterday, driving in this driveway, and he came out, and it was for wholesome bread, and the color scheme was yellow, orange, and blue, and you can just picture these old letter press, uh, printing presses, that, that can, the lines were distinct, they were kind of raised, and you just had the picture, it was banged out on something, so. So I go way back with the Leahy Press, and I'll have to tell a Leahy story, too. Oh, absolutely. My parents and Mary and Patrick's parents were the closest of lifelong friends. And the family story is that my father was the first non-family member to hold Patrick when he came back home from the hospital. And the story is that Mary's mother, Alba, said to my father, Mandel, she said, Mandel, would you like to hold the senator? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> but anyway, it's, a, it's an old family joke. <laughs> I just have to add about the three, the three color business, I remember so well. Um, and I don't, maybe this is, again, mid-50s, um, but a group of men from Stowe um, came down to the shop and ordered uh, what was for us just this almost impossible thing. Um, it, 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 it was a poster or a brochure or something that had at least three colors on it. And these guys and my father, and plus a couple of the printers who worked with my father for years and years and decades, um, were actually members of the family, um, just adopted it. But they worked day and night, Saturdays and Sundays. My mother would cook, you know, all this stuff to keep them going. Um, and when that, they finally figured out how to produce this thing with the colors, and it, it rolled off the little giant press that we had. I mean, there was a big, if my parents drank champagne in those days, which they did not, they would have uncorked a bottle of bubbly because it was such an achievement and they were hooting and hollering and, and, and slapping each other in the back, and it, it, it was a great achievement. That was the old letter press. Now it's obviously no problem at all. 
Mary, thank you very much. And we will to the Carolyn Cover Library with Carolyn Brennan, who will give us some background and some history on the library. Thank you. So I brought more than 10 items. So if I'm doing, really doing show and tell and holding all these things up, I've got less than a minute, a minute apiece. So the Kellogg Covered Library has uh, more than 125 year old history at this point. But it is the fifth library or version of a lending library to exist in the city of Montpelier. Uh, so there are land, lending libraries from the Department of Agriculture. Um, but for one of the things that I brought today, there was a rival library. So I apologize because when I was thinking about this, I had a very busy weekend. I got married yesterday. <laughs> okay, I know this cold, but I usually, when I'm giving the presentation on the history of the library, I'm usually in the library. So I am walking through the building and pointing things out. And so I have to do a version of that in my head while I show you all these items. Um, so I don't know how many of you know the, the history of the library, the contentious history of it, um, but it started in 1889 uh, when Martin and Fanny Kellogg, uh, they, were, uh, they had grown up uh, in this area and then they had made a fortune in real estate in uh, New York City. They died within a couple months of each other uh, in the winter of that year and Fanny on her deathbed uh, left $300,000 uh, $300, to the city of Montpelier to build an archway at the Green Mountain Cemetery and to build a library for the citizens of Montpelier. And she had a nephew, uh, John Hubbard, who is right here. And John, uh, he um, contested their will. He said that the people that were, uh, the people that had signed the will, that had witnessed the will, didn't know what kind of document they were signing. And so this bitter three-year court battle ensued that went to the Vermont Supreme Court uh, over this inheritance. And I have all of the documentation on all of that, uh, actually, uh, in the archives of the library. Sorry, I'm shaking. I don't do public speaking very <laughs> often. Um, so, anyway, so John, uh, he, he wins this court battle. It goes all the way to the Vermont Supreme Court. And then he settles and he says, okay, I will build a library in the city of Montpelier, but I'm going to spend $30,000 on this library. Uh, and, and that was the settlement that was agreed to. And so he did not agree to staff the library, and he did not agree to buy books for the library, <laughs> but he built a, built a wonderful granite building. Um, he did it by the time the library opened uh, in 1895. It, it had a soft opening in 1895 and an official opening in 1896. Um, he ended up spending $60,000, so he was a little bit better than his word, but nowhere near the 300,000, which would be about 9 million uh, in today's funds. So, uh, in the meantime, while all of this was going on, uh, T.W. Wood of the T.W. Wood Art Gallery and John Burgess, who was a professor from Columbia who summered at what is now Redstone, um, or it's called Redstone, uh, they were his, they were John Hubbard's biggest detractors through all of this, and they villainized him publicly and often and in the newspapers and the rhetoric that they employ is something to to read so uh, one of the things i have in my office if anybody ever is really interested as interested as i am in all of this um, i have the um a statement from the opening of the tw Wood art gallery and it's partially celebrating their gallery but an awful lot of it is like boy isn't this guy a bad dude <laughs> Spends a lot of time uh, a lot, and a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of venom. So, uh, T.W. Wood and John Burgess, to protest this library that was being built, they asked the citizens of Montpelier to boycott it, and they founded a rival public library called the Montpelier Public Library Association. So now I'm actually going to get to the items I brought today. I have a photograph here. This is the interior of the Montpelier Public Library Association, which was in the Opera House at the time. So uh, often we have a smaller version of this that, that is in the library above our locked case collection. And people often look at it and they say, oh, you know, is that, is that in here? Is that in this building? And I said, no, this is actually 
this is, I can't even believe this is in this building, quite frankly, because this was, these guys would not have come into this building. So I got that there. Um, the Montpelier Public Library Association, while they were in existence for six or so years, they didn't last very long before they kind of, uh, before they actually ended up merging with the Kellogg Cupboard, but they sold shares, and that was how you became a member of the library. So shares were $5 a year in 1895 funds, uh, and so I have a few of these in plastic that you guys can, can look at and handle afterwards if you want to take a closer look at. It's beautiful copper plate handwriting on there. Um, and then I have a the book of shares with all of these historical names from figures uh, from people in Montpelier. It's very fascinating to look through. Another thing from before the Keller cupboard was built that I have that doesn't come out very often is this photograph. And so this is what is, I, I believe, somebody in here can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that this is uh, right here that says it's the library reading room is now what is Mankey's Bakery, right next door to the library. So uh, to build the Kellogg cupboard, and you can see, um, you can see the Trinity Church right next to it here, that's still there because that predates the library building. So this was the site of what is now the library before the library was built. Uh, now when the library was built, I'll talk about the building a little bit. I've got a couple of pictures of it. I have this lovely picture of it on um, Dewey Day. So this was a Dewey Day parade day um, out of the, in front of the library. So the library was uh, designed by an architect called Amos P. Cutting. He was from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, Amos Cutting built the library out of two foot thick Dummerston granite. So it's not very granite, which I would have expected when I started working there seven years ago. Um, but I think maybe because of his ties to Worcester and maybe the southern part of the state, I honestly don't really know, uh, but it's Dummerston granite. And the interiors are Corbison oak, and the columns out front are North Conway granite, which is why they are pink. Uh, and I think the furthest away that any of the materials for the original building came from um, is Tennessee. So the, the facade on the inside of the porch is called Tennessee marble, but it's really a kind of limestone. And in the right conditions, excuse me, in the right conditions, if there's enough humidity, it turns mauve and it's lovely with pink and gray. It's very, it's quite a sight to see. I've only ever seen it happen once. So I have some pictures in here, also of the original interior of the library. And these live in my office, and I love them. And nobody, ever, nobody else ever really gets as excited about these as I do. But when you look at these interiors, if you go in the library today, I should have brought like today photos, because this is exactly still what it looks like. It's exactly right. Like you can stand there and look at this image and go, I'm standing in the exact spot this photographer was standing in in 1895 and hasn't changed. And that's one of the things I love about the library. So we still have the curved glass at the desk there. And then this one is in the reading room. And this is still our front reading room. And it still looks like that. <laughs> um, and the tables that you see in this image, not the chairs, but the tables themselves, are the tables that are still in the building. They're original to the building. And we still use them every day. They have lots of graffiti names, but don't go in and do that or I'll have to kick you out. I'm also the, I'm also the chief disciplinarian at the library. <laughs> and then you can see in this one, you can see the original width of the, um, of the mezzanine area that opens up to our beautiful skylight. So the skylight has been at points covered up and, uh, and then uncovered again about 20 years ago. And the mezzanine area with the balcony, originally in the library, it went right out to the width of the skylight. Uh, and then in the 1970s, I believe, uh, it was, the, the library was modernized. There was an elevator put in in 1974 for the first time. And a lot of that skylight was closed off and a lot of that was built in. Like the, the, the ceiling to the second story was built in so that the opening was very, very narrow. And, a lot, and I still have people that come in the library that remember it then. And they come in and they're like, oh, this is, this is beautiful. Because when we built the addition uh, in 2000, that was opened back up again. So you get this sort of, this sort of more original soaring to, uh, upwards towards the skylight feel when you come in this in our beautiful building. Um, all right. So Martin and Fanny catalog, John Howard, we got there. I heard somebody else earlier talking about the, the Spanish flu 
Uh, at the time of the Spanish flu, there was also a polio outbreak uh, in Montpelier. A terrible, a couple of terrible polio outbreaks in 1917 and 1918. Uh, and for both the Spanish flu and for polio, the library had to close down for a period of a few months. And this was one of these things that we we thought about, we remembered when we had to close down for the COVID uh, pandemic, because uh, realizing that the length of the history of the library encompassed these other epidemics, these other tragedies, and that this was not the first time around. It was the first time around for all of us, but not for the building. And um, so the library closed down for a couple of months. And one thing that happened uh, during the polio uh, epidemic, but not during the Spanish flu, was that books that were returned to the library from, in, from families that were suffering from infections, those books were burned. So because they didn't really understand how some of these infections spread. Um, what else do I have here that I want to talk about? I have the history of the first hundred years of the Kellogg Henry Library that will summarize this a lot more logically than what I'm doing for you right now. Um, but there are a couple of historical errors in it which are very fascinating also. Um, and at the back, there's the original articles that, uh, that were in the Arc, I think, was the Argus and Patriot at that point? Or yeah. the Evening Argus? Yeah. Um, from when the building opened and talking about all of these beautiful elements and all of these beautiful materials that went into our original building. I also have one fun thing I brought that speaks to the history of the funding of the library. So the library is a 501c3 nonprofit, which is about one third of public libraries in Vermont, but only about 15% of libraries nationwide. Most, libra most public libraries are municipal entities. Um, but we're a nonprofit, and that has to do with that very first founding, with John Hubbard's um, agreement to the, 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 what the, the wrangling that went into the formation of the library. Uh, and but it didn't take very long. I told you earlier. So he built a building, but he didn't staff it, and he didn't buy a collection for it. So the trustees, some of the first trustees of the library, said, "Okay, City of Montpelier, will you help us with this?" And I have this lovely protest saying, absolutely not, unless you turn over ownership of the library to the city of Montpelier. Oh. So this was written as a protest, and I have, a, I have versions of this uh, from different years, and that were published in the newspaper saying, we're not going to fund you at all. Uh, and we still go to the city of Montpelier now every year, as well as five surrounding <laughs> every towns, and say, can we be on your town meeting <laughs> morning? <laughs> can we please, will you please help fund us? Um, and happily, we don't see fees anymore. People are much more generous. <laughs> and then the last really cool thing I've got is uh, I brought John Hubbard's will. So thinking about this contentious history and this court battle and all of this rhetoric that was going on around the founding of the library and the formation of the building, uh, I, John Hubbard, in all of this, he died like five years later. He died in his 50s. He got uh, liver cancer. Um, he actually fell off his bicycle. He, had, he was one of the early bicyclists in town. He fell off his bicycle and he got very ill. It turned out it was liver cancer and he died at a, at a, at a fairly young age without leaving any surviving heirs. Um, and, uh, and we have his will. And in his will, uh, he left the remainder of his fortune to fund the library, which is our original endowment that we still have, that we built on for the last 100 years, 125 years, uh, and he left the money to build the archway at the Green Mountain Cemetery, which is why that exists now. That was his aunt's original vision, his aunt and uncle's original vision that he protested against, and then on his passing, he built it. And of course, there's a very haunted gravestone. Mm -hmm. I assume you all know about. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Can I answer? Does anybody have any questions? Brian. Yes, please. Uh, two questions. When I was a little boy, before the upper uh, balcony was made smaller, yes. there was a large picture of Abraham Lincoln, life-size standing, okay. at the, at the uh, end of that wall. Number one, does that still exist? No. I mean, well, maybe, but not in the library. <laughs> and my other, well, damn, whoever. I know, yeah, uh, I, I want to hear more about and, this. And the other question, when, again, when I was a child, the children's library was in the basement of the rear part of the building. Yes. It was beautifully painted with murals of children's stories. Yes. 
who did that? Are there good photos? And can you see any of that today? Sure. Uh, so who did it was uh, college students from what was the Vermont Teachers College. Uh, and I do have some photos of them. We don't have a lot of photos of them. You know, the library has flooded twice, including the children's libraries. The children's library spaces, well, the first time the library flooded, the children's library didn't exist. Um, but in 1992, the children's library flooded, flooded again, and a lot of that was lost. There was a lot of loss at that time. Um, so I don't have a lot of pictures. I do have some. Um, and you cannot see the basement has been painted, gosh, twice since I've been there. Uh, so those, all of those beautiful um, children's book murals are long since painted over. And I, I don't believe any of them still exist. Yeah. Anybody else? George, thank you all for inviting me down. My pleasure. Um, first of all, I'll explain maybe a common mis misconception. Uh, our place is built, uh, even in some advertisements, uh, around as a eight generation, having been around for eight generations. And we haven't been on this the same farm, the same place as you all know. That Morris Farm Sugar Shack stands now for that number of years, but um, what it, the eight generations refers to as Morses have been in the maple business, have been sugar makers for eight generations. So it started with um, way back in the late 1700s with um, would be my great 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 grandfather James Morse who came up from Massachusetts and settled in, in Cabot, Vermont, and uh, did several things over here. He was one of the first, first um, founders of Cabot, and then his son ended up in Calais, Vermont, uh, just over the hill, and that's where the majority of those eight generation years were spent. Um, that's where I spent the, the first five years of my life, up on Robinson Hill in Callis. Um, and then, well, my grandfather, Sidney Morse, came from Callis down to Montpelier. I don't know how often it would have been back in his time. Um, not very often behind a, a team of horses. And he'd come by the, the place where we are now. Uh, that Mr. Bliss owned it. And he'd say to himself, I love that farm, it's flatter, it's better drained, it doesn't have so many ledges, I'm going to own that farm someday. And, and he did. He, bought, he was able to buy the farm where we are now. And, um, well, I'm sorry, Grandpa Sydney, but boy, have I found a lot of rocks in the ledges. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm retired and I won't have to look at the board. But we have developed a, a, a substantial maple name on that place. And I've contributed. Uh, my father, Harry, uh, started it off with his, his charisma and his uh, abilities to please the public and be a sugar maker at the same time. And uh, then... Um, I, uh, my father was handsome, he had charisma, uh, and then I came along <laughs> and uh, was able to follow his footsteps to a degree and, and expand on his, uh, his grow, uh, growth there. Um, so our business is the way you see it today. It stands just over the line in the town of East Montpelier, but I've always built it as being in Montpelier, which is our mailing address, for obvious reasons, people are going to the capital to see um, the Vermont uh, State House, and I figured we're so close to that <coughs> we could entice some of them up to our place. 
which has, has been the case. We have a lot of, lot of visitors up there. Uh, speaking of the Robinson Hill, I didn't bring a whole lot today, and I'm really impressed with the other displays of other people um, <clears throat> have brought. But one thing I brought is my grand, maternal grand, great grandfather, Irvin, Irvin Robinson's uh, sap yoke. You see how what a brutal thing this would have been. And uh, it's even got a lot of wear marks on it. I don't know, a lot of use. Maybe his father was behind him with a sharp stick. I don't know. <laughs> um, what, a, what a brutal way to make a living is carry uh, two five gallon, probably uh, wood stave sat gathering pails <clears throat> on each arm of this, this uh, thing over my shoulders and sometimes four feet of snow. For humans, I don't know if I can even <laughs> replicate um, one of the codgers who used to wear it. But <clears throat> That's it. Yeah. 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 Hey. No, no, no. I'm not going to go back to work. <laughs> we, when I was young, we had. Uh, galvanized sap buckets, and we didn't use one of those sap yokes. Uh, <clears throat> it was a matter of carrying two uh, galvanized gathering pails with full of sloshy sap, and uh, trudging through the snow, often with snowshoes. And I developed a bit of a, a bad attitude about snowshoes. It seems like some of the people, especially Newcomers have moved into Vermont. Choose snow, snowshoeing is a matter of recreation. <laughs> and uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't put a pair of snowshoes on until you're absolutely desperate. <laughs> and the snow's that high, um, and I have used them for gathering sap uh, quite a few times. And then, of course, it evolved into plastic tubing and uh, vacuum, vacuumizing the whole tubing system, which actually tricks the trees. The inner pressure of the maple tree has got to be greater than the outer the atmospheric pressure. So you put negative pressure outside the tree in the tubing line, it thinks it, it's going to trick that tree into always having greater inner pressure, and it's going to give out sap more at the time. And so there's been some innovations like that and reverse osmosis and the things you hear about, which we don't hear about at all today because this is a historical society meeting. <laughs> now, I'm, uh, I'm not going to take much longer at all. I did, I did bring another artifact, and, and I know I wasn't going to be outdone by anyone bringing the oldest artifact who, who brought an older artifact than I did. So, this one here is, uh, I don't know, how many million years old is this? <laughs> or maybe, is it a billion years? Yeah. <laughs> it's the oldest one here. No, but, <laughs> but this was written, um, my grandmother uh, told my wife, my late wife Betsy, the story of this rock. And it is a a lap stone that an ancestor of mine, Mr. Bar Barnabas Doty, used uh, in his sleigh. And you know why churches around had uh, box pews and instead of just uh, parallel pews, but so that they, they could use the lap stone and under buffalo rags in their sleigh to get to church to keep warm then carry the stone into the box pew and under the same buffalo robe to warm themselves at church. And this was part of us his stone. And uh, his dates were early 1700s to uh, 1759, I think. My wife wrote that date down on this stone. She wrote it for my two boys so they would have 
this is a memento. So, where this stone is, how many million years old, was more recently used by uh, a young guy named Barnabas Doty in the 1700s, and he was a descendant of Mr. Edward Doty, who came over on the Mayflower, and, and they're, I'm, uh, they were ancestors of mine. Now, to summarize, I have to tell my own president's story because Mary told hers and the queer boys told theirs and I'm not going to be outdone with this. <laughs> I put this story in one of the books I wrote. Uh, a letter written by President Eisenhower to my, my grandfather, Sidney Morse, who had sent him a gallon of syrup. And uh, it was a personal letter and I should have brought the book and could read the letter, but um, it goes something like Mr. Morse. A group of fine Vermont students recently brought to me a gallon of your maple syrup, and uh, Mrs. Eisenhower and I wish to extend our sincere thanks for the gift of your maple syrup. And, uh, I gave him a whole gallon? <laughs> Why I haven't seen a president in my whole life, I'd give more than a half a pint. <laughs> so I'm out of time. Uh, questions? Maybe choice will allow. I don't know what Paul. So I gotta tell you, when I was a kid, I need to add some more to the family, your family history, to a lot of families in my player. Um, you used to be an Olympic skier. You were quite the skier, and your father and my father started an East Montpelier Catalyst Ski Association. And in your field, uh, across from the barn, used to be a rope tow. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first ones around. That all of the all of the neighborhood kids would, every weekend would flock to that field. And, uh, but we used to be, remember you skiing down the steep part of the slope, and everybody thought, yeah, look at he's so good, we ought to be like her. <laughs> <laughs> well, trying to change. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yes, I know your sister Peggy went through one of the pulleys up on it. Thank God there weren't quite so many lawyers back in <laughs> <laughs> Peggy's alive and well and yes. a wonderful member of Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. It's been a great event. Hey! Thank you. Thank you. Now, Stephen and Christine, if you will tell us about J. Leo Johnson. Hey! Okay. Yeah. I'm Steve Murphy. I until recently was a practicing attorney here at now, but I retired a year ago. And it's yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so, my grandfather, uh, J. Leo Johnson, uh, grew up, uh, was born in Craftsbury in 1890. He was the son of Martin Johnson, who was a uh, Irish immigrant, and Mary Gallagher, who was from Craftsbury. He graduated from Craftsbury Academy in 1908, and in 1910, two years out of high school, started selling insurance and Indian motorcycles. Hardwick, and Hardwick. Wow. In 1913, he started selling cars in Harvard, sold his first car to Reverend William B. Crosby, P. Crosby, who was then the uh, pastor at the St. Norbert's Church in Hardwick, who later moved here and was here pastor at St. Augustine for 40 years. But, so he sold his first car to him. Um, and then, in 1913, he started selling cars uh, regularly in Hardwick. Um, he joined uh, forces with uh, Pierce, Mr. Pierce, so it, it was called Pierce and Johnson, selling Maxwell cars in Hardwick. In 1915, he bought Pierce out and was on his own. He then bought a building on Wolcott Street uh, in Hardwick for sales. Um, and in 1920, he purchased the Hardwick Inn and the, the uh, buildings that were adjoining it and he turned part of the Hardwick Inn into a sales shop. And I have a picture here 
that I just got. Actually, I think uh, this might be one of the ones that, uh, where is she? In the back, um, she gave me this picture, but it's a picture of the heart again with all of the cars for sale out in front. And that would have been back in the uh, 1916 or 18. Uh, no, 1920, excuse me. Um, he married uh, Margaret Stevens, who um, was a, an heir to the International Silver Company. Um, and they met in Hardwick because her family, who was from Meriden, Connecticut, a rich family, used to come up, like a lot of people did, in Greensboro and Craftsbury for the summer in their fancy houses up there. And uh, they met and fell in love and uh, when they fell in love, my great-grandparents decided they would move Marguerite to Seattle, Washington to get away from this guy. Because right? they didn't think you ought to be marrying some, <laughs> some farmer from Vermont, right? So um, they moved her out there, and he shortly thereafter drove across country and uh, picked her up. They got married in Seattle and moved back here and settled here. So and. And as a result of that, she was disinherited by her family because she married this Catholic farmer from Harvard. <laughs> in any event, um, in 1919, he started, uh, a Chrysler Corporation was started by Walter P. Chrysler, who was previously the president of General Motors Corporation. And he wanted to start his own business, so he started selling Chrysler's. My, my grandfather, J. Leo Johnson, um, got in on the ground floor. Um, he was selling Maxwell's and then he started selling Chrysler's. And um, in 1921, he opened a dealership here in Montpelier at 102 State Street, which is where the Colton Garage used to be. Um, he also, in 1922, opened a second place in Barton. Um, and in 1926, he moved his dealership to a new building that he bought at 84 State Street. This is the original building. This is like in the 1890s. But this is uh, the building which was the Bishop's Hotel. And this was the uh, village, village, what? village Hall, excuse me, the Montpelier Village Hall. He bought these two buildings, and he also bought what used to be the uh, T.W. Uh, T. Wood Art Gallery, which is the next building up. He bought all three buildings, and he renovated. And I have a picture here <coughs> of the building after it was uh, redone in 1926. And at that time, Goodrich Furniture was in the uh, one of the buildings uh, that he had bought, and. Uh, there was a dry cleaning company in the back of the Two Wood Art Gallery building. But if you notice, if you, if you look at the two buildings, you can see that this back uh, Village Inn building right here, they actually added, left that building as it was, and they added a, probably a 15 foot addition on the front of it to bring it out to the level of the Bishop's Hotel. But that, so it looked like a new building. Just the false front put on. And um, so that's in 1926. Um, he also opened a dealership at 86 to 88 St. Paul Street in Burlington. And uh, that then moved to 11 North Avenue in Burlington a little later, where the Burlington Police Station is now next to Battery Park. Um, so between 1924 and 1928, J. Leo Johnson was the sole distributor of Chrysler, Chrysler's in New Hampshire and Vermont, and I think part of Maine. And at that time, Chrysler had dealers had uh, distributors rather than selling directly to dealers, and so he sold. Uh, he was the dealer. And this is a picture in, from 1927 or eight. Um, of all of the dis uh, distributors in the United States. And he's standing in the middle there with a lighter color suit. And in 1927, 
he sold more cars than any other dealer in the United States. Wow. And that's in Vermont. Wow. wow. And I, I don't have that article with me, but I did read an article from the time, the, uh, not the Times Argus, but the Argus, right. in the 1920s that said that, it, that in one year in the 1920s, he sold $10 million worth of <coughs> cars, and that included repairing cars and whatever, but $10 million sales in 1920. It's a lot of cars. <coughs> Um, so for t from 24 to 28, he was the sole distributor. Um, in 1926, uh, I told you that he already opened one in Burlington. Um, in 1927, because he sold more cars than any other dealer in the United States, he won from Chrysler a, a trip to uh, Paris. So in the fall of 1927, he took off to Europe with his wife and they toured Europe. And while he was in Paris, he ran into a uh, priest who, from Vermont who was there visiting and asked him, did he hear about the flood in Vermont? Oh, wow. And uh, so he was over there. And my sister told me today a story that I have to tell you too. My mother was here because they were in Europe and he and uh, my uncle and my mother were here in Montpelier. She was a young kid and she was waiting for one of the uh, people from my father's, father's dealership to pick her up to bring her back home because they lived on Liberty Street at that point, where I now live, but up the street they lived next door to the Edsons uh, on uh, Liberty Street. and. Um, it started raining and kept raining and whatever, and she ended up, the guy ended up picking her up and bringing her home, and then the flood hit. And uh, that was the only, I mean, she was hiding under the steps of the pavilion, or under the, you know, window. When we were kids, the pavilion was on a raised porch. Right. And there was no enclosure at the bottom of the pavilion. Right. She was sitting under there to keep dry, waiting for this guy to pick her up. When he picked her up and took her home, that was the only car that was saved out of the uh, dealership. He lost 350 cars. Oh, wow. And besides that, because of the flood, the whole dealership was under 11 feet of water. Yeah. Um, so he basically uh, had to pick up and start over after the 27 flood, because nobody had flood insurance back then. Nobody even thought of flood insurance back then. Um, So that it, supposed, it, according to the newspaper article that I read, there was $120,000 in damages done to his business in front of the flood, which in 1927 was a lot of money. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about when I was a kid. And the reason I have the work, ethic, the work ethic that I had was from my grandfather. My, my father. My mother and father both went to law school because my grandfather told her, you know, if you don't know what you want to do with your life, if you go to law school, you can always get a job somewhere. <laughs> go to law school. So she went to law school. And she met my father and they got married. They got out of law school and they moved back here. And my father decided that uh, he would, this is after the war, he went into the Second World War first, but when he got back from the war, he was going to start working with my grandfather, and he would uh, take over the business when my grandfather was going to retire in 10 or 15 years, whatever. And unfortunately, my father died when he was 43 and left him with nobody to take over the business. So he continued on. When I was a kid, he thought I needed to learn to work. So when I was 10 years old, every Saturday, I had to go down to the shop and I would uh, clean out the, the, all the rooms and the you know, offices and whatever and I would pump gas and I would wash cars and then I would go back uh, in the shop and I would change oil with Dodgy who used to work uh, at the store and uh, change the oil in the cars and whatever and that's how I learned my ethic and I even got my first firing experience from there. <laughs> he thought I was doing so well with cleaning the garages that I ought to be able to clean those front buildings too every week. And he would pay me $10 a week, which I thought was great. 
But he expected that I would come back two or three days after school and clean. I thought, well, I'll get there on Saturday morning anyways. I'll just sweep out on Saturdays. So finally he got to the point, he said, I was expecting a little more work out of you for 10 bucks. So I, I, ended, up, I ended up going back to just sweeping out the front uh, office. I also used to clean out uh, Senator Prouty's office, which was in the uh, Wood Art Gallery building. But, and uh, just some of the names were mentioned before in some of the other presentations. Dr. McIntyre's office was in this building. Hebert's Hardware was in one of the buildings. Um, the florist shop, I think. There was a florist shop in there, and there was a, a dress shop. I don't remember the name, Jim. But anyways, um, in addition to, well, after the Second World War, he had a real tough time, at the time of the Second World War, he had a real tough time finding cars, because you couldn't get cars, because they were setting everything to the war effort, right? So he couldn't get tar cars, he couldn't get tires, so he was buying used cars to try to sell them because they didn't have new cars to sell. And he and Bob Doyle, who's uh, Mr. Doyle over here's uh, father, were good friends, and the two of them used to dream up ways to try to make extra money because things were so tight because of the war effort. So they would, uh, at one time they, uh, they drove to Boston to pick up used tires because you couldn't buy new tires. So they would buy a truckload of used tires and bring them back up here. And then they invented a way to make sandpaper tread tires. And they would spread tar on the ground and you would roll the tires through the tar and then you'd come up to a sand pile of sand and you'd roll it through the sand and that was sandpaper tread tires. And that's, that's how sandpaper tread started. <laughs> uh, anyways, going on. In 1964, um, I'm sorry, I missed one thing. During the time he owned the, the State Street property, he also owned a used car lot on the Baron Long Play Road. So it was next to where Harry's uh, mm -hmm. used to be and where the Burger King is now in Midtown Chrysler. And um, so in the late 60s, or early 60s, excuse me, he um, was going to be retiring soon. So he took the first part of the lot and he built um, a building for Merle Wood. I don't know if anybody remembers oh, Merle yeah. Wood, but was Merle right. Wood's country store. There yeah. was one in Winooski, now there was one in Berlin. Yeah. So there was a, a Merle, uh, Merle Wood's country store was built there. Yeah. He also built the first automatic car wash in the state of Vermont, which is still standing there now, but it's only used by Midtown Chrysler. Right. That, I used to work in that when I was a kid for a while. Uh, and he also owned the place that is now in Midtown, was then Midtown Chrysler later. So in 1964, he decided he was, he was 70, about my age, 73, 74. And he uh, decided, oh, maybe I should retire. And he sold the Chrysler dealership to Don Cody, who is Bob Cody, who runs the Chrysler the, uh, Chevrolet dealership's brother. He sold that to the dealership and part of the Harry Montpelier Road property to Don Kobe for the Chrysler dealership. And they started Midtown Chrysler there. And he spent six months helping them out to set up the business. Um, and then, because he was contracted to do so, then he decided he was going to retire. So he took a five-week vacation in Florida. And he got back here and he decided, I can't take retirement. This is not good for me. <laughs> so he went back to the State Street property and he sold used cars out of the State Street property until he died in 1967. And uh, in 1967, he died during a trip to uh, Meriden, Connecticut, where he was reestablishing re a relationship with the, the Stevens family that had and so upset with him because he married that daughter. Uh, so he went, that, he went down there and he had an a, a aneurysm while he was there and died. Um, and after his death, the, uh, the buildings, all three buildings, were sold to, um, I might go blank when I'm thinking the name of the, uh, the Averys, who owned the Montpelier Tavern. And that was to build what's now the Capital Plaza Tower, the higher part of the building. So that sits, these three buildings are all on the site 
where the, where the, the uh, Capitol Plaza Tower is now. Um, see if there's any, I do have pictures of, well, I wanted to mention one other thing that I didn't mention. I have pictures of, um, this is the inside of the village in back part of it that was a showroom. I have a picture of my grandfather and grandmother. I have a picture of uh, J. Leo Johnson as Pearson Johnson in Hardwick from the 19, whatever that was, 1918, something like that. And I have two pictures of the several workers that worked at my grandparents, uh, my, my grandfather's place. And I'm always amazed. Uh, these, these, this is a group that was there when I was a kid and worked there. And everywhere I go, I meet people that used to work for J. Leo Johnson. Mm -hmm. And I never met anybody who fought Napoleon. He was always a nice guy. I'm not saying he was an easy guy to deal with. <laughs> Apparently, he could have sold uh, you know, a water bottle to somebody who was, uh, you know, didn't need to be drinking, but whatever. <laughs> he was quite a salesman. But, um, but I, all of these guys I knew all the way through it. Even when I was in college and came home to work, I worked at Allen Lumber. Some of these guys were working at Allen Lumber when I was there. People that were, uh, Bev Hill who was here. Her father used to work for my father. Um, I don't know if actually, did Bob Doyle ever work for my father? Yeah, I knew that he started his own business after, but he would work for him originally. And a lot of these people, when he came back after retiring for five weeks, um, he he um, had the garage, he sold used cars, and Wendell Lamell, who was in one of these pictures, uh, who later had, well, he had the tavern garage, I think, at one time, and then he built, had a uh, garage in Middlesex where the, what's the name of the place that now is a hamburger shop there on the side of the road across from the a filling station? The filling station, that's right. Oh, yeah. He owned that filling station there um, later on. But he came back. He was the only employee at that point. We, at one time, there were 70 or 80 employees. Oh. Wow. But at, when he died, there was one employee, and that was the mechanic who was one of them. I think that's all I have. Any questions at all? Or? <coughs> yes? I often wondered what his first name was. Joseph. It was Joseph Leo Johnson, but apparently it's funny because why well, he never called himself Joseph? I don't know, but my same thing. My uncle, his son was David Paul Johnson. He was all always D. Paul Johnson as well. I always called him Pop. <laughs> yes. Very curious, what was the village hall to the um, on the right side there? And had that been built as the short-lived Second Congregational Church. I don't, it looks like it could have been from the looks of the top, but I don't know. I, I thought the village hall was a meeting hall for people in Montpelier, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a church previously. No, I think it was. It could be. I mean, it has the right side, the right shaped windows, and it has a, you know, kind of a steeple on top. But that, at the time he bought it, that was big, a big open hall. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, if you walked from the back where all of the uh, repair shops were and all that stuff, and the sales rooms, um, you could walk up the back of this building on a big ramp, and that big open space was up there, gray store and extra cars. Okay, thank you. Only because, um, well, it was not as old as yours. You definitely have the oldest one. <laughs> but um, when we were um, teenagers, we went to uh, Washington, D.C. to visit our cousins. And um, we had six kids in our family, and they had nine kids in their family. And um, my uncle was a, my uncle was a general. And uh, so he, uh, knew exactly where the Kennedys would be going to church. So there was this hall, and it was an empty hall except for our families. Steve remembers this too, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, so when we, we got to the church before the Kennedys did, 
but we um, we all travel, we all went up to the front of the church, thinking, of course, he's going to be in the front. So we filled the whole hall all the way across with all with that many kids, right? We're the only ones in there, and um, we're all waiting and waiting for them to show up. And I remember. Um, Somebody, it, the whisper started to cross, you know, between us. And eventually somebody said, you know, he's here, he's here, right? So I turned around to look, and there was the most, just, they were just so beautiful. I, that's all I can say is they were just beautiful. Um, Jackie had a, what? And the few behind. And the few, well, they were a few back, because it was a ways away, I remember. But yeah, we had to turn around. And actually, the first thing I need to tell you is, when I turned, he winked at me. <laughs> so that just, uh -oh. to this day, um, I will always remember. I, agree with you. I was, I don't know, we were 11, I think, maybe? It's a good, it's a good thing it wasn't Quentin then, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so that was just special because um, Jackie, I have to tell you what she was wearing, because it was just exquisite. It was a baby powder blue. Um, you know, this was a Catholic mass, by the way. Um, so you had to wear the veil at that time. You, know, you wore a veil covering covering your face or down over your face a lot of the time. But definitely something on your head. But this was a veil covering her face and coming around to about here. And it was sky blue to match her dress. And um, it was just breathtaking. And he had a blue suit on, and then it was John John and um, little Caroline. And John John had the shorts, you know, the suit with the shorts and the tie like at the funeral. So um, it was just priceless. And that was in, that was in August, and he was assassinated in November. He was assassinated a few months later. Wow. So that was really heartbreaking for us. Also, um, we also got to meet Bobby and. Um, I remember we were coming, he was coming out of the Senate, and they um, turned it. Somebody said, oh, there's Bobby, and I didn't know who he was. But they said, go oh, shake his hand, and I, I did. And you just remember their piercing blue eyes. They were just so charismatic. Um, I'll never forget that, and of course I shook his hand. It was pretty exciting. To, I had to tell you. Hey. <laughs> Next to the last, so uh, I'm going to make it short. We're running maybe a little bit over. So I am uh, going to talk about main manufacturing. What happened? Well, I'm going to, the more, most of the story I'm going to tell you is why are we talking about main manufacturing? And so the story kind of goes along like this. Uh, about well, five years ago, I was with a local gentleman, and he said that he had some artifacts from Lane after the fire when they were cleaning up. And he had some, didn't even know what they were, but someday he'd like to uh, put them on exhibit somewhere. That was the first uh, clue that I had that maybe that was something we'd do someday. And then uh, the next event happened last July when a uh, hippie mushroom farmer, hippie is a good thing, uh, uh, wrote this email. Hello, I live in northern New Hampshire near Coburg. I've uncovered a seemingly very old sawmill buried in the ground. The sawmill was produced by Lane Manufacturing Montpelier. It is stamped Sawyer's favorite. Anyway, quick story uh, was that I got in my vehicle and drove to Columbia, New Hampshire and looked at these pieces of this Lane sawmill one of them is sitting right there. I made a, a later trip, and he loaded that in my truck alone, and that says Lane Montpelier, and that was kind of the the, uh, the piece I wanted because of its identification. And so the next thing that happened was that we determined there was a mill, there is a mill, the Garland Mill in Lancaster, New Hampshire, and they are actively using a Lane Mill regularly to do post and beam construction for post and being a uh, home. So this our next, was our next exposure to Lane. Uh, the next thing was the Robinson Sawmill, and uh, many, many of you know about this already. 
but in Calais there is an antique lane sawmill that is being reconstructed and uh, I made connection with Chuck Storrow, Larry Gilbert and others on that. So that was the next lane connection we had. And then uh, Brooke Page, uh, who's here with his wife Donna, uh, an inveterate collector, uh, lent us some papers from lane manufacturing that he had purchased from a picker. And so now we had even more materials. We had been planning to produce an exhibit at the Walgreens window, which we did do last November. And I'm, I'm thinking that uh, many, many of you have seen it because we got tremendous feedback on that. So that's kind of the follow-up here. These banners are part of what was in that display. Uh, let me just talk quickly about the timeline of the, of the lane manufacturing. Uh, and I want to make, before I forget, we have a lane with us, Priscilla Lane Alexander is sitting right over here. So Dennis Lane, the founder of the company, we still have lanes five generations later in Montpelier. So Dennis Lane was born in 1818 on East Hill in Barrie. Uh, moved to Plainfield at age 26, and in the 1850s was logging with his brother in Marshfield in an area that became known as Lanesboro because they were so active in that area. And in 1850s, during the 1850s, he invented uh, the Lane Lever Set Sawmill, and uh, he found that the inconvenience, inaccuracy, and imperfections of the machinery for setting the log forward led him to investigate the matter. And what, it, what that means is, in order to saw a board, you used to have two people. They had to reset every setting on the sawmill. And he invented a method by which you would pull a lever and it would automatically go to the right location. So it was revolutionary in the logging in the sawmill industry worldwide. Uh, in 1857, while he was still in, in uh, uh, Marshfield and East Montpelier, he began making the mills. But in 1863, he decided he had to, to get bigger. And they came to Montpelier and bought the Waterman Mills, which is the area that the main manufacturing is at now. These same mills were first settled by Jacob Davis, the first settler in Montpelier. Jacob was granted this land by the original proprietors uh, under the condition that he built a sawmill and a flour mill. And that, uh, that is uh, the importance of that area of the, of the mill. In 1867, a Pearly Pitkin uh, joined him. He had been a quartermaster general in the, at the, in the Civil War. And James Brock. James Brock was a major character in Montpelier. For those of you that have not heard of him, he lived in the big brick house across from the library, and he was involved in everything. And they started the company known as Lane Pitkin and Brock. In 1888, Dennis Lane died at their peak, and it's suggested that the peak of the company was, was similar to about the time that he died. Uh, there were seven acres, 11 buildings, 100,000 square feet, and 150 employees. Uh, another family that was really big along with the lanes were the Pitkins. Some of you know Caleb Pitkin and uh, Cabin in Marshfield now. Caleb is in the same tree, but a different branch. And uh, so there was four Pitkins uh, that were in the business and, and a number of lanes. Um, Cutting right to the quick, in 1961, the company went bankrupt uh, during, the, during World War II. They had some war production, but it wasn't enough. After they closed down, Denny Lane, who was a descendant, uh, I think great-grandson of Dennis, uh, ran the shop with a small crew making parts for the sawmills. And it suggested that there were 5,000 Lane sawmills around the world. So that's, that's my, uh, oh, I love this thing here. This is Sawyer's favorite dog. A dog is a device that uh, is a 
resets things, and uh, some of you may have a favorite dog also. And one other thing was that I really loved in the paperwork that we came across, this piece that you're looking at right there, uh, here's a picture of it, and we know exactly what that is. That is the Lane Suprex Compound. Now, I, because of time, will not go into any more of this. I have a stack of, of really, really interesting papers, and uh, uh, you're welcome to look at them later. There's a copy here, maybe one of the most interesting things, a copy of the original deed when Dennis Lane bought the property, a deed dated 1863. And it's very clear here that that's the deed for, for the purchase of that property. So, I'm, I'm done and we're gonna pass this over to Manny Garcia, wherever you are. Okay. And Manny is our last presenter.
the bridge washed out downstream. And if you look at this bridge today as you drive across it, the second version of that has been raised some. But this bridge right here, and there is a bridge there if you get a magnifying glass and can study it, you can see the similarity of houses and know just about where you're standing on Stonecutter's Way. <clears throat> and then today as the bridge stands, it's still in place now from just about 1900 to uh, the present day. The second phase of my little report here, and of course this is the, the whole thing about this thing is bits and pieces of the south side, the dirty side of Montpelier. But this right here is the Sloan General Hospital. And what you, what you see here is a hospital that was built during the Civil War and it was kind of a pavilion style. It was built in a circle. And if you want some uh, clarity as far as program, this right here is Main Street. And this is the Main Street uh, the hill and the, and, and the sharp corner going up there. So back in those days, this was one of the first, although not the first, set of buildings that was built. And, uh, and Vermont, it was a hospital for these, uh, uh, it was a hospital in, in Brattleboro, and there's a hospital in Berlin, excuse me, uh, Burlington. And then this one here was built in Montpelier, and the injured troops would come in on the train and be taken up to this hospital which was on the campus, so to speak, of Vermont College. So that's what you're looking at there. And these are technical plans of the architect, of the layout, the insides, high ceilings, meant for good airflow. And an interesting thing about this um, was it was ran and administrated by Dr. Henry James. He was a Waterbury surgeon, and he came to, rent, to, 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 to run this hospital. And later on, this hospital was, uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly, just the time. I was going to say probably not too much more than two years. Uh, this hospital, okay, was replaced by, by the, uh, the building on College Hill. And also, some of the uh, those uh, buildings in the right side of the of the board were uh, were part of the, uh, the original hospital for the Civil War vets. And later, all of that when I was all dismantled, uh, there were some of the remnants of the buildings that were once part of this hospital. And you can see these buildings very clearly if you walk along College Street or First Avenue, the higher part of First Avenue, or also if, you, uh, if you're over around what was mentioned earlier, Emmons Street. Uh, you'll see uh, this greenhouse right here, the yellow house, uh, the, excuse me, this right here. You can distinctly find these houses that were once part of the pavilion of that uh, of that Sloan Hospital, um, and last of all here, what I have here are some remnants of my family uh, in businesses along the river of Montpelier. And here again, the the, the chief thought here was uh, focusing on granite. This was my grandfather, Harry Bertoli, with his wife. And this is his first granite plant that he built coming over from Carrara, Italy. And this granite plant, inside this, if you have a magnifying glass and you can look closely, you'll see the, uh, the, the statue being built, the carved of uh, Little Margaret, famous uh, uh, person in the uh, Green Mountain Cemetery. 
But uh, here is little Margaret, and there is a house up on Tatman Street in Montpelier. Now his granite plant was just below, across the street from Tatman. But it was known as the, uh, that whole area was known as, 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 as Pioneer. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of Italian immigrants had come there to settle. My grandfather had his own business in that area and he would get a call in the night and uh, say that there were some migrants that, uh, that had come uh, into the Montpelier station and he would take a horse and buggy and go to Montpelier from the Pioneer area and uh, bring these people home to his house and then later to supply them with, with jobs. Um, this, uh, let me see here, okay. My grandfather ended up having a large granite plant that was, that was built just downstream of uh, the, uh, the, the, the New Lucy River. These are just a few other incidences of different uh, manufacturing that was going on in the south side of Montpelier, so to speak. This was on what is what today we know as Memorial Drive. And looking beyond there, you can there's a uh, the Capitol building. So this building is just off the Main Street Bridge. And this is here. This hip here is where the building was developed. Uh, there was a saddlery hardware manufactured there. There were door springs. Uh, Colton was the manufacturer of door springs. The fellow on the very left was Henry Colton. Uh, he was Henry Colton, and he was he had a, a business in there, the manufacturing saddlery hardware. And while all of this granite was being coming into the area across the way here, we just had more uh, talking about the Excelsior granite. These were all clustered somewhere around the Grand Street Bridge along that stretch of road. However, uh, no granite manufacturing would be ever, ever taken place as, as strongly as it did without... This was the first power plant, and it was just uh, upstream from the... Uh, again, upstream from the Pioneer Bridge on the Winooski. And down below in the interior of that of that uh, mill. So this was built for manufacturing, but in 1888 it was, it was uh, converted over to convert electricity. And uh, there, I have some pictures here of plants that are at the base of, uh, one plant was at the base of Gallison Hill. Another plant was upstream where they built a pedestrian bridge across the river. But up there, it was a dam for years that supplied this building right here. Um, it's a very ornate little buildings, and Corey, Devitt, and Frost were the businessmen that uh, foreseed that. So this right here was just upstream of that large dam near the Capota dealer. And this right here was at, roughly at the, at near the base of the of Gallison Hill. So this was just all, these were all businesses and manufacturing concerns that came to be on the south side of Montpelier. And that's all I have. Manny is our historian extraordinaire and has done a tremendous amount of work over the years, uh, written articles, um, done a lot of research, and we thank Manny very much. Uh, we're done. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope we, we ran over a little bit of what we said we would, so I hope that's uh, not too bad. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>